Hello and welcome to our session on the National Treatment Principle, our second session on the National Treatment Principle. In our previous one we laid out the general structure of this article. We also saw that this article, namely GET Article 3, is complex, highly complex from my perspective and I'm certainly not the only one here, overly complex. I've given you a brief insight into how it works, how the paragraphs are interconnected with each other and today I'll flesh out the details of this provision. So we'll look at notions such as the one of like products or directly competitive or substitutable products. So where to start? Get article 3 paragraph 2. What does it say in general with its technical language? The technical language you'll find everywhere in the GATT, the treaty on trading products. The products of the territory of any contracting party, so of any GATT member or WTO member, imported into the territory of any other WTO member, shall not be subject directly or indirectly to internal taxes or other internal charges of any kind in excess of those applied, and that is significant, we'll come back to that in a few minutes, directly or indirectly, again, so be the direct tax related closely to a product or having indirect if effect, so somewhat connected to it, too, and this is particularly important, like domestic products. So once again, we encounter the notion of likeness here, and this will be one of the core subjects of our lesson today. Speaking of which, first things, first things first, a few matters, subject matters that need to be clarified here. So, so the WTO is sometimes accused of being overly restrictive or somewhat curtailing sovereignty of WTO members, but however, upon closer inspection, it simply prohibits discrimination. As a reminder, first and foremost, we're still in a non-discrimination area here, so no discrimination between domestic and foreign products, and that's the end of the story. However, it does curtail sovereignty to some extent in the sense that it prohibits discrimination. So what does that mean? What do I want to clarify here? Every state is allowed to impose very high taxes. Now, that's not the problem here. However, it cannot impose excessively high taxes on foreign products and low taxes on domestic products. So it is against protectionism. Yes, you have a restriction of sovereignty in this regard, but it does not tell a state that it may not impose high taxes at all, or it does not oblige states to impose low taxes. Not at all. It simply says tax all you want. High taxes, low taxes for us, from the perspective of the WTO and WTO law, that's fine. The WTO only has a problem with tax discrimination. That one aspect of WTO law I wanted to clarify at the outset here. What is the scope of this provision? As we saw in the very article itself, it relates to taxes or any other charges. So the name here does not matter. You can call it a tax, you can call it a contribution, whatever. That is not the question here. Everything that is being referred to in paragraph 1. Also, it does not, in this sense, refer to tariffs or any other charges in connection with the importation or exportation of products. So everything you have to pay at the border in connection with the collection of tariffs is outside of the scope of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2. It only becomes applicable once goods have been imported, lawfully imported, that is. So in other words, the tariff, that's sort of the entrance ticket. That's not of, none of the business of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2. It only becomes operative once the product has entered the entrance ticket. So you can imagine like in a cinema, someone working in the cinema is responsible for how consumers, how the visitors to the cinema behave, but, and then he's being, or she's being endowed with the responsibility, for example, that they don't throw away their trash or don't throw it at the screen because they're mad at one actor, for example. However, his or her competences, competences do not extend to what is happening outside of the gate because there you have a cashier, but this is not his or her 
responsibility. Same goes with GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2. Everything related to the importation or export or exportation is outside of the scope of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2. That's more of the business in particular of GATT Article 1, the most fair nation principle, and GATT Article 2, the one provision relating to um, tariffs and bound tariffs, so saying that states unilaterally declare, themselves, declare that they will not impose higher taxes than a certain percentage, for example, but this is not of the, none of the concern, none of the business of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2, and therefore will not be dealt with in today's session. Good. First, what I want, also want to emphasize here is that we have some cases that have flashed out the general principles of this article. M many of these cases also deal with alcoholic beverages. This is not because the WTO is particularly fond of alcohol or WTO lawyers and practitioners are particularly fond of al alcohol. It's simply that some of the main cases, some of the main jurisprudence of the WTO deals with alcoholic beverages. We'll come back to that in a few minutes as well. And the main case is Japan Alcoholic Beverages 2. So one of the earliest cases of the WTO, so this was when the WTO dispute settlement system was first becoming um, functioning, when it first became operative, when it dealt with the first case, the first questions whether there was discrimination, yes or no. Japan Alcoholic Beverages 2 from 1996. This is one of the main cases of WTO law you need to remember. And as the appellate body, so you could say the quasi-Supreme Court of the WTO held in this connection when first describing the general structure and aim of GATT Article 3 Paragraph 2, it said that the words of the very first of the first sentence of this provision require an examination of the conformity of an internal tax measure with Article 3 by determining first, whether the tax imported and domestic products are alike. So, once again, we have to find out are two products only somewhat similar or 100% identical. Think of cars. Huge car with four doors and a very small one, a city cruiser with only two doors. Are they similar? Yes. To some extent, both of them are cars. Are they also alike in the sense that they are 100% identical? That's a different question. So this is the first answer we're looking for. And the second answer we're looking for here is concerning the question whether the taxes applied to the imported products are in excess of those applied to the like domestic products. So two-tier test we need to do here. First, determination of likeness. Second, is there an excess in taxation? So in other words, are the foreign products taxed with a higher percentage, for example, than domestic ones? Because that, obviously enough, implies protectionism. And speaking of likeness, as I indicated already when we were talking about the most red nation principle, there is no definition. There is no generally accepted definition of likeness. This is a problem but a problem that has been somewhat resolved first, you could simply say by rationality, we can all think of, okay, what exactly is likeness? Are two products 100% identical? So to some extent, we can all give ourselves the answer. It is perfectly clear that beer and vodka are somewhat similar, but they're not like products. The devil, as always, however, is in the detail. But the lack of a definition, a generally agreed definition, in treaty law, for example, or any other side agreement of the WTO is not that much of a problem because we have a lot of jurisprudence by the WTO itself and also a working group under WTO also hammered out some of the details, some of the key questions, factors that need to be taken into account when determining whether two products are alike or not. In making this determination, all the available facts and circumstances have to be taken into account. So you look at everything that relates to a product when, or two products or se several products when determining whether they are like in the sense of get article three, paragraph two. At the same time, however, keep in mind that the one picture that was drawn by the WTO in connection with likeness, where it said that it is like an accordion, you stretch it and you squeeze it, that related to likeness in the get in general, because 
It's mentioned several times in the get and it is not, however, always the same concept. So this may, may, may sound a bit confusing, but like is not always like. Like in connection with get article one, the most read nation principle may be different from get article three and the national treatment principle. It is even somewhat different in get article three itself. So likeness appears in get article three paragraph two and then again in paragraph four. However, these are again, not the same concept. They are somewhat different. Get article three paragraph two Sentence one, I know this is confusing, but at the end of this session, it won't be as confusing as it is at the beginning, I'll promise. So this notion at the very beginning of get article three, paragraph two, is not as broad as the one in paragraph four. Why not? Because it is somewhat restricted by the catch all phrase you find in sentence two, the second category of products we discussed in an earlier session, the one that says also directly competitive for substitutable products, foreign ones shall not be used or shall not be treated in a way that violates the notion or the prohibition of protectionism. The SATAP test so as to afford protection we found or we find in GET Article 3 paragraph 1. So you squeeze it but you don't squeeze it that much but at the same time you don't stretch it as far as amounting to likeness in the sense of paragraph four, because right now we're still speaking of paragraph two of the get. When it comes to likeness, there are four criteria you need to take into account. The first one is you look at what are the end uses of products. So how do consumer behave? How do they, how do consumers behave? What do they use it for? In other words, that's similar for two products. That's already an indication that they are like. Relatedly, the second factor in this account, in this connection, are tastes and habits of consumers. Interesting enough, the WTO again, and I remember that well, during the 1990s, yes, I am that old, there were many debates about the WTO and its role in international trade. And some saw it as being at the forefront, a champion of harmonization and not the good type of harmonization but the one where everyone every country would increasingly become like the US. How so? Because this was what Charles Krauthammer for example famously described as the unipolar moment. He largely referred to military power. This was the end of the Cold War so the US was somewhat left as the sole superpower on the global plane but also an economic and political power and relatedly also a cultural powerhouse. So if you look at old photos from the 1990s, you'll see a lot of the kids, including myself, you won't see me on the picture obviously, but still, you will see a lot of kids and also adults wearing t-shirts, sweatshirts, and so on and so forth, wearing some imprints with strange sentences in English and somewhat referring, alluding to the US. So this was a, an obvious sign of US cultural dominance as well. Again, everyone grew up with US movies, US music, US culture. That could obviously have an impact on the notion of likeness. But the WTO, and this is why I'm making this large detour, is not considering likeness in the sense of one product is like in each and every country, in each and every market. No, quite the opposite. The WTO says consumer tastes and habits differ from country to country. So two products might be like products in one country, but they do not necessarily have to be considered as like products in another country. Why? Because consumer tastes and habits may differ once again. But at the same time, however, when assessing the likeness on the basis of consumer behavior, keep in mind that taxation is also, and this is one of the key aspects and the underpinning reasonings behind taxation. It's not only about budgetary matters, it also wants to, and the government by imposing taxes, wants to drive consumer behavior into a certain direction. So for example, countries impose high taxes, perhaps on alcoholic beverages to prevent their people from drinking too much or from developing a drinking problem. Here, that means that if there is an excessively low tax on a domestic product and a very high tax on the foreign ones, 
obviously enough, people will buy the cheaper products, but that does not mean that they are not like products. It simply means that consumer behavior was influenced by taxation. So that also needs to be borne in mind when applying the notion or this factor of likeness, consumer tastes and habits. The third category, or the first factor, more precisely, that needs to be taken into account or that may be relevant when assessing likeness of two or more products are the properties, nature and quality. So this refers to physical characteristics, to chemical characteristics. This is where WTO lawyers take a step back and say, okay, let's look at what experts tell us concerning the physical characteristics of a product. Are they similar? Yes or no? This may be an additional factor when determining likeness. And last but not least, what about the state itself, the state in question itself? How does it categorize or classify a specific product in contrast to another product. If they, for example, fall under the same tariff category or in other, ru other rules concerning products, if they are using the same category for two products, that's an indicator that the state itself considers them to be like. And if they fall for the purposes of, for example, regulation in the same category, but for the purposes of taxation in different categories, in different tax categories, there might be something fishy here. This is the one factor that alludes to the behavior of states itself, while the other three factors are more objective, they are applicable irregardless of how tastes of states or governments themselves apply or regulate or classify two or more products. They are independent of state behavior, i.e. objective, as objective as objective can be. And last but not least, keep in mind that the factors I just described to you are not exhaustive. So this is not an exhaustive list, this is a list of examples. These are the main fa factors that should be taken into account when determining whether two or more products are like, but certainly not the only factors you could think of. Again, we're thrown back to the general notion of applying a determination on a case-by-case -case basis. If you look at all of the factors, all of the circumstances, and whatever may be an indicator to determine likeness also should be taken into account here. And at the same time, however, again, I would like to emphasize that in general, national treatment tries to protect competitive relationships between and among products, as it was held by the WTO itself in Philippines distilled spirits, a case from 2012, again about alcoholic beverages. Good. About physical characteristics. The case I just mentioned is one of the main cases concerning this factor. And it was held here that these physical characteristics are not necessarily decisive here. So, in the words of WTO itself, Char products that have very similar physical characteristics may not be like if their competitive or substitutability is low. So, in other words, you still look at how does the consumer behave. It may be that even two products are on the face of it, if you take it to the laboratory, are identical, but something else leads the consumer to discriminate between these products and However, not because he or she should not discriminate them, but simply because for the individual consumer, they are not like products, even though you could say physical characteristics are similar. At the same time, however, it was further continued in this case to state that products that present certain physical differences may still be considered like if such physical differences have a limited impact on the competitive relationship between and among the products. So, in other words, even products that present, present certain differences may still be considered like if the nature and extent of their competitive relationship justifies such a determination. So, think of quality, for example. You could say one is a higher pro quality product, the other one of a lower quality. Think of food products, but at the end of the day, the individual consumer does not necessarily, you could say the stand consumer, look at the quality or physical characteristics they're still competing with each other. So physical characteristics do matter, but they are not decisive. Another question that was 
answered in the Philippines distilled spirit case was what about the raw material base? So this also relates to physical or chemical characteristics. And again, as I mentioned here, as you can see on these pictures, different alcoholic beverages. And at the end of the day, what matters is their raw material base. So what happened here was that the Philippines used, the government used different excise tax rates and they were dependent on the raw material used to make the spirit. So again here, it looks very objective, not necessarily discriminatory, but if you look behind the veil, it could be the case that some products made from, raw material, from certain raw materials were taxed on a lower level and surprisingly enough, these were products made by Philippines manufacturers. So you could again here have disguised discrimination, indirect discrimination. So what you could see here was that specific types of imported distilled spirits were subjected to internal taxes in excess of those applied to like domestic spirits of the same type made from different raw materials. And the question here was, okay, if you look at all of these distilled spirits, regardless of their raw material base and their origin or type, so brandy, whiskey, rum, gin, vodka, tequila, tequila flavored spirits, are they all like products or even if they're all distilled spirits because the raw material base is different, are they still different and does it does justify tax discrimination? And it was held in this case that the raw material base is largely irrelevant. So what you see here, and the case refers or the decision refers to like products and refers to the notion that get article 3 paragraph 2 only speaks of like products and does not mention their raw material base. And to quote again, as long as the differences among the products, including a difference in the raw material base, leave fundamentally unchanged the competitive relationship among the final product. So you see here, once again, it's all about the decision of the individual consumer or the decision of those who are targeted by a certain product, um, who, shall buy, who are supposed to buy a certain product. That's what matters, not what happens in a laboratory, for example. And as long as this competitive relationship is unchanged, the existence of these differences in the raw material base does not prevent a finding of likeness if, by considering all factors, the panel, so the WTO panel established in this case, comes is able to come to the conclusion that the competitive relationship among the products is such as to justify a finding of likeness under Article 3, Paragraph 2. So once again, competitive relationship may be independent of what is being said or determined in a laboratory. And this brings us to another related question and the one I addressed or indicated earlier concerning cultural dominance. For example, and by way of example, um, the US in the 1990s, early 2000s, culturally, you could say almost a hegemon on the international level. Now, somewhat cultural decline. For example, this year's Oscar went to a foreign movie, surprisingly enough, but other than that, you still have a predominant position of the US and of US products. And it was held here once again, however, and I would like to emphasize this point one last time, if two spirits are considered to be like products in a given market, this does not necessarily mean that they would be considered like products in another product. So the panel in the Philippines Distilled Spirit left open the possibility that it is conceivable that brandy and whiskey made from some raw materials and those made from other raw materials may be considered as like products by consumers in the Philippine market, but that they may not be considered as like products by consumers in another market. This is the very essence of what I earlier noted in connection with case by case basis. You look at the situation in one country and in the market of one country without necessarily staying, stating or going as far as saying this is a universal standard. This is a regional standard or perhaps only a standard applicable in one country only. Good. At the same time, however, this leaves unaddressed the question, what about 
the way a product is being manufactured. So the conditions of production. What about social rights, labor rights? What about the impact on the environment if a certain product is being produced? And usually for the WTO, this does not matter because once again, it's about the competitive relationship. But at the same time, however, there are two notable exceptions, several more, but two I want to address here. First, think about halal or kosher meat. Regardless of whether you can taste the difference or not, in some markets where, for example, Islam plays a predominant role or um, in Israel um, concerning kosher meat, it might be the case that for consumers it does matter how a product was being manufactured irregardless of the final taste. So indirectly the conditions or the pro process production methods, PPM, do matter and meaning that uh, to the fact that kosher meat and non-kosher meat are not like products regardless of how the final product tastes or that halal meat or non-halal meat are not considered as like products in markets of where the majority of the population is Islamic. At the same time, however, what also could matter here is fair trade products or products that were manufactured, you could say in Austria would call it bio, so where the producers guaranteed that certain standards of treatment, humane treatment of animals are being guaranteed. And again here, that could be the case that these products are not considered as like. Same goes for fair trade, a fair trade label, that is supposed or the very essence of the fair trade, trade label is that it guarantees consumers that workers' rights and social rights are respected at least to some extent. So while the final orange juice made out of oranges produced with say lower levels of protection or lower le social levels, levels of social rights of the workers associated with the production of an orange juice might at the end of the day taste just like the one where the oranges were being harvested by workers enjoying higher standards of labor rights and social rights. You won't notice in the final product, but nevertheless, products with a fair trade label on it might be different than products without a fair trade label on it. And also therefore could justify a different tax treatment regardless of whether they're foreign or domestic products. If, for example, in a given market consumers have a high level of awareness and also want to ensure that the rights of the workers associated with the production of say for example orange juice that these rights were being guaranteed. So indirectly process and production methods could play a role if for example um, there's a high level of consumer awareness or if consumers are in a highly religious or in a religious country. However the last element that I mentioned earlier concerning tariff classification or categorizations by a state itself. They may be helpful. Again, Philippines distilled spirit, this spirits case is mentioned here. They may be a helpful sign of similarity, however, only if it is sufficiently detailed. What we have here is a so-called harmonized system, HS, with different headings. This is the system used by most WTO countries, but if it is not sufficiently detailed, if it is very broad, simply referring to all distilled spirits as well as other liquors and unflavored neutral spirits for human consumption or for industrial purposes, there, and that, that was held by the WTO, this does not constitute a tariff classification that is sufficiently detailed. So in this sense, if you have such a broad category, you couldn't say, okay, they're all like. Why not? Because as you can see, in the example in this lengthy quote I have included on the slide, it includes all distilled spirits and also all other liquors and unflavored neutral spirits for human consumption or even industrial purposes. This category is far too broad because otherwise you could say a contrario that all of these products are like and this is certainly not the case because for the individual consumer if you use it for industrial purposes or for consumption purposes and then treat them as like products, bad idea. And then in this connection, however, if you look at the explanatory notes to the harmonized system, so the one system used by, mo by most WTO members, including a six digit code for products, there, however, they do refer to material from which the spirit is distilled, namely grape wine or grape mark for brandy and mash of cereal grains for whiskey. 
And here, however, in the explanatory notes, according to the WTO panel, there is an indication that tariff classification would not suggest that domestic brandies and whiskies made from some raw materials are like imported brandies and whiskies made from other raw materials. That also needs to be taken into account. So not only the tariff classification itself, but also the explanatory notes. As we said, all the factors have to be and can be taken into account here. Good. So to sum up everything we said about likeness for the purposes of GET Article 3, Paragraph 2, the determination of whether two or more products are like is all about the nature and the extent of a competitive relationship between and among imported and domestic products. You simply look, for example, and this is the most um, telling example, you look at the behavior of the individual consumer in a supermarket. If an individual consumer in a supermarket says, um, I'm going to buy some noodles today, mm, shall I try the Italian ones, Barilla, or shall I try other ones? This is the one moment you have in, in your mind when making a determination of likeness from the perspective of WTO law. But at the same time, this determination is not a value judgment. It does not, usually does not look at the political, social or environmental circumstances or factors in, in the country where the production takes place. Indirectly, yes, if you have a high level of consumer awareness. Indirectly, yes, possibly if there is for example, if it relates to a religious pro to a product that needs to be manufactured according to religious principles, but in general, values, morality are irre irrelevant here. All that matters is the competitive relationship. So it can be indirectly in some cases, but in general, we also only look at what is happening at the market, what drives the, the decision made by the individual consumers. There was, however, and this shall briefly be mentioned, another test for likeness and one that sounds on the face of it fairly reasonable, the so-called aims and effects test. What does the aims and effects test say? As the name already tells us, it looks at, okay, what is the final result of a certain measure and what is the underpinning motivation for having adopted a certain measure? And there it said, okay, you know what, the WTO said, let's skip all of these difficult determinations where the two products are like products and simply look at what is the final result, what is the outcome of a certain measure. If there is a significant advantage for domestic products, that implies protectionism. Again, get out of free paragraph two, paragraph one only allows non-protectionist aims so as to afford protectionist prohibited or it was recognized by the WTO member that they shall not give render protection give protectionism to domestic products and of the story there seems to be likeness and the one case where this rationale was applied is the case US taxes on automobiles there are two taxes that were being imposed the first one was a luxury tax that applied to cars that were sold at over thirty thousand dollars and then the question was are cars more, that are more expensive than $30,000 and cheaper cars, are they still like products? What was the underpinning rationale here? Directing consumer behavior. On the one hand, maybe you want to prevent consumers from buying luxurious taxes, luxurious cars, or at the same time you could say, you know what, let's tax the rich. Let's tax them when they buy ex highly expensive cars. Again here, does not necessarily amount to protectionism. It could, however, indirectly amount to protectionism as the final result is that you realize that $30,000 is the one border, you could say the one frontier of cost where imported cars are being sold at, while most of the US cars are sold at a price, at a price lower than $30,000. So that could imply protectionism, just to give you an insight as, the, as to the questions and mindset you have to apply when answering this question. And it was also in the mind of the members of the panel applying the aims and the facts test. And then again, you have the gas guzzler tax that was also imposed in the US that was applicable to the sale of automobiles attaining less than 22.5 miles per gallon. Again here, the underpinning rationale was to save energy, or in other words, to promote the consumption, promote or 
give an incentive to consumers to buy cars that are less harmful to the environment. And in this case, it was found that there is no protectionist element here. So even if these 22.5 miles per gallon benefit US cars or US manufacturers, that by itself is not a problem if the underpinning rationale here is to prevent and pro I'm sorry, to create an incentive to buy environmentally friendly cars. So if cars with different energy consumption or are not considered as like for these purposes, there is also no violation of GET Article 3, Paragraph 2 of the GET. The big problem here, however, we'll come back to that, is it is missing in GET Article 3, Paragraph 2 itself. It was somewhat something that was interpreted by the panel into this case. It was read into this provision. But what did it say itself? It said that the term so as to, so the one that you find in GET Article 3, Paragraph 1, but not to, says that a measure could be said to have the aim of, fact, aim of affording protection if an analysis of the circumstances in which it was adopted, in particular an analysis of the instruments available to the contracting party to achieve the declared domestic policy goals, so tax the rich or environmentally friendly promotion of environmentally friendly cars, demonstrated that a change in competitive opportunities in favor of domestic products, so what if the domestic products, most of the domestic products um, consume less than 22.5 gallons per hour, if there was the desired outcome and not merely an incidental consequence of the pursuit of a legitimate policy goal. So in other words, it could be the case that there is indirect protectionism, but it was not the aim. The aim was, again, to save the environment, save the planet. If that means that some cars, because US manufacturers, hypothetically speaking, we know that this is not really the case, but if hypothetically speaking US consumers, then if you look at it, manufacture more environmentally friendly cars, all the better for them, but it was not to protect them, but simply because they chose to manufacture such cars, no likeness according to the aims and effects test. Same here, also if you think of different tax treatment between foreign cars. So if, for example, say German manufacturers are the first ones to realize that there is now more global demand for environmentally friendly cars and their cars are thus taxed at a lower level than cars from, say, the UK or France, because there the manufacturers were a bit slow in realizing that there is more demand, that by itself, because the aim was not to afford protection, would mean that there is no likeness in the sense of get out of free paragraph two. But the big question and the big problem here, and this was held in Japan, alcoholic beverages too, um, by the panel said, yes, there might be such a case, whatever, but it is not consistent with the wording of article three, paragraph two, first sentence, because so as to afford protection is mentioned as we said at the very beginning of this session and also the earlier one is mentioned in Article 3, Paragraph 1. But the first sentence does not only not conclude these words, but it does also not refer to Paragraph 1. This is only in Sentence 2, where, however, you do not have the notion of like products, but of directly competitive or substitutable products. So, to sum up, this might seem like a reasonable test, simply saying, okay, you look at is there protectionism at the end of the day, and then if there is protectionism, you can say this is, uh, these products are like products and therefore there is a violation of GATT law, of WTO law. But because there is no such reference in GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2, Sentence 1, this test could be applicable perhaps in connection with Sentence 2, but not Sentence 1. Because Sentence 1 simply says like products, no tax discrimination whatsoever, end of the story regardless of whether there is a protectionist element or not. The protectionist element only becomes relevant when speaking about the second sentence, but not the first sentence. That's why the aims and effects test was rejected in Japan Alcoholic Beverages too. The other problem with this connection is also that you don't always know the aim of a certain legislation. So, for example, as it was also admitted in the case concerning the U.S gas guzzler tax, there might be 
a multiplicity of aims. So maybe you want to protect domestic manufact manufacturers, but incidentally, you always you also enhance the protection of the environment. Or maybe there is even a third one you couldn't even think of. So this is the first problem. You don't know which was the aim that is relevant for the aims in the fact test if there are several aims. Then you don't always know what is in the minds of the legislators. You don't always have access to the complete legislative history. Or it could be difficult or even up, up impossible for the one WTO member filing a complaint to access the whole records. Maybe some of them are not accessible to the public. Maybe they don't even exist. And even if you have a complete legis legislative history, so all of the preparatory documents, all of the speeches, all of the proposals, so you would be able, again here, you to somewhat determine the final or the aim, the ultimate aim of a certain legislative act. Nevertheless, it could be difficult for outsiders to assess which kinds of legislative history should be primarily determinative. What do we mean by that? What weight needs to be given to the works of some preparatory um, party, group? You could say, okay, you have a bundle of experts, they made a suggestion, but no one ever took it seriously. And this one suggestion said, there shall be no protectionist element, but you'll only look at the environment. What if there is a statement by a minister that was, however, only for domestic, for reasons of domestic politics, but not because this was his real aim behind that? So, again, you have such a confusing and large amount of different records, speeches, documents that might be relevant when determining what a state or a government really wanted to achieve with a certain measure that at the end of the day it is impossible and this is a general pr general problem of international law quite often it is impossible to look inside the mind of a state or more precisely of a government and that's another reason why the aims and effects test was rejected this is a question that should not be of concern because quite often you won't find a satisfying answer to how to assess the aim or what was going on in the hypothetical mind of a government in the first place. That's another reason why the aims and effects test was rejected. And today you would look at a more objective standard, a so-called rule of reason approach. So again here, if a state imposes trade impeding measures, they need to be justified on a reasonable basis and there should be a non-protectionist manifestation of legitimate non-trade policies, such as protecting the environment, protecting workers' rights, preventing people from developing addictions, and so on and so forth. And if these, this rule of reason approach is fulfilled, there is no violation of WTO law. If the legitimate political choice, policy goal that is being pursued is the sole reason for a measure, that may nevertheless still have an undesirable effect on a foreign product. It is not discriminatory if it's the principal reason and if the measure in itself is neither discriminatory nor disproportionate. So there is some similarity to the aims and effects test, but once again, you don't look at the aim and the effect, you look at the likeness of two products and a bit less on the final result. And if the final result is relevant here, you look at, okay, once again, you look at, is it justified as a reasonable or a non-protectionist manifestation of legitimate non-trade policy, social rights, environment, and so on and so forth. Good. And now the second major question. So as we said, the very first question, are two products like products? difficult determination that needs to result on a case by case basis on the basis of first and foremost the four, the, the four factors I described earlier. The second question is, is there taxation in excess of and quote the taxation applied to domestic products? So in other words, only 10% on domestic beer, 15% on foreign beer, that's obvious discrimination. And again, what is important here is that even the smallest amount of excess is too much. In other words, there is no de minimis threshold. What do we mean by that? If you have a tax difference of 0.00001%, 
You could argue, well, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But again, it says in excess of, regardless of how small this excess is, or in Latin, no de minimis threshold. Some tax difference is okay when we speak about the second sentence. But if two products for the time being, and this is why this whole difference between sentence one, sentence two matters. As long as we're still in the area of sentence one, as long as we still ask ourselves the question whether two products are like products, we say, okay, once two products are identical for the purposes of WTO law, you, they have to be taxed at the very same level without any difference whatsoever. You could say in theory, if there is really a tax difference of 0.000000001%, it doesn't matter, but strictly speaking, no tax difference whatsoever is allowed if two products are like products. And this leads us to the second sentence of GET Article 3, Paragraph 2. In the second category, the one we encountered in the in the previous session, directly competitive or substitutable products, the one we find in the note add article 3. One of the other reasons why this article, this article 3 in general is so complicated because there's also a cross-reference to this note add that somewhat further clarifies or describes this provision. So, even if you answer the question whether two products are like products with a no, that does not mean that there is no violation of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2. Simply says that there is no violation of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2, Sentence 1. But there is still another sentence. You could say the catch, not all provision, but catch a large number of products provision. So, if two products are not like, they might, might, might still be competitive or substitutable. And you have three answers you need to answer, answer here, three questions you need to answer here. And this also goes back to Japan alcoholic beverages too. First, are imported and domestic products directly competitive or substitutable? Second, are they not similarly taxed? So a very, very small tax difference is okay here. Plus, third question, is this dissimilar taxation applied so as to afford protection to domestic production. Remember the cross-reference in sentence two to paragraph one of GATT article three, this is the SATAP test. This is where article, uh, paragraph one of GATT article three somewhat indirectly but still becomes operative. And here we also have interesting case law, in particular, once again, Japan alcoholic beverages or also Chile alcohol case where it dealt, the WTO dealt with Pisco, a Chilean alcoholic beverage, a national product such as shochu. What is the question here? In Japan alcoholic beverages, the WTO determined that vodka, be it Russian vodka, French vodka, Grey Goose, you name it, Polish vodka and Japanese shochu, that they were like products in this case. But Whiskey, brandy, gin or rum were not considered as like products. So there is an obvious difference also from the perspective of the individual consumer. He or she will not treat shochu just like he or she will treat whiskey, brandy, gin, gin or rum. And here, again, and this is where I would like to make an example. You could imagine it like going to a bar and you had a rough day. Speaking of cliches, you go to the bar, you go to the bartender and say, I had a rough day, give me some and have it to drink. If he or she didn't, then gives you a whiskey and you, someone in your mind thought oh, you really want vodka, however, you can't complain because then you could say to the bartender, I wanted vodka, but he said, he will then answer, well, you said you wanted something heavy, something rough because you had a rough day, but I didn't know that you wanted vodka. Whiskey is also has a high percentage of alcohol, end of the story. If you say, give me vodka, and then he or she gives you shochu or stolichnaya or absolute vodka, you then can't complain because all of these products are like products. If, however, you then get whiskey, you can still say, wait, I said I wanted a vodka shot. Well, these are like not like products. If you say you want something 
heavy, something with a high percentage of alcohol and you get whiskey, although you may have preferred vodka, no reason to complain. So maybe this scenario helps you understand the difference between these products. And that goes back all the way to the same, somewhat famous Japan Alcoholic Beverages 2 case, where the WTO looked in detail our vodka and shochu 100% identical because of the way they are being produced, because of how Japanese consumers behave. They may have an, a natural preference for shochu because of the national drink, um, a famous one, part of their culture. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, if, for example, you're invited to a Japanese party and someone tells you bring vodka and you bring shochu, perhaps that's not a problem. I'm not that familiar with Japanese culture concerning drinking habits, but According to the WTO, shochu and vodka were considered as like products, whereas other high percentage alcoholic beverages such as whiskey, brandy or gin were only considered as directly competitive or substitutable because there is a noted difference between these products and shochu or vodka. There is a high degree of substitutability, but not a perfect one. They are not 100% identical. And again, also referring to the Philippines distilled spirit case, they refer to when determining whether two products are like or direct, directly competitive or substitutable, they also relied on studies and they said that there was a significant degree of substitutability in the Philippine market between imported and domestic distilled spirits, as well as instances of price competition and evidence of actual and potential competition between imported and domestic distilled spirit. So this was the first factor that said, okay, even if they're not like, they may still be directly competitive or substitutable. Plus, there was also an overlap in the channels of distribution, plus similarities in the product's physical characteristics and uses and market. And therefore, marketing, I'm sorry. And therefore, the applet body, so again, the Supreme Court of Trade Law Matters, and then said, okay, the earlier finding of the panel is being supported that all domestic and imported distilled spirit, spirits that were dealt with in this case are directly competitive or substitutable, even if they're not like products. So again, all the factors are relevant not only for determining whether two products are like, but also when determining whether they're directly competitive or substitutable. And this means at the end of the day, Likeness is the narrower category, directly competitive or substitutable, the broader one. So in other words, all like products are also directly competitive or substitutable products, but not all directly competitive or substitutable products are also like products. This somewhat uh, hopefully clarifies the relationship between these two products or categories of products. And the essential difference, however, is that you have more than the minimis tax difference that is necessary here. So in other words, there must be some element of protection. That's what I alluded to earlier. If you have a 0 0.000001 tax difference, I guess most consumers will not de decide which product they prefer on the basis of a sum of money that they cannot even calculate, or it will not be reflected in the final price of a product. Also, if there is only a very, very small difference, it will obviously usually also not have an impact on the individual decision of the consumer. Once, however, it amounts to, let's say, 10 cent, 50 cent, one euro, that could have an impact on the relationship between these products. That could have an impact on the individual decision of consumers, of buyers, and therefore there could be a protectionist element. But once again here, case by case basis is relevant. But keep in mind, if two products are like, it does not matter if there is only a very, very small difference in taxation. No taxation difference whatsoever is allowed if two products are like products. Some tax difference is allowed between different directly competitive or substitutable products. And when determining whether a tax difference amounts to protectionism, we ask ourselves a very long question. Do the design architecture, structure, and overall application of the measure at hand reveal a protective nature. Once again, case by case basis. I would note and refer here to the example of Japan Alcoholic Beverages 2, and I quote, 
the very magnitude of the dissimilar taxation in a particular case may be evidence of such a protective application as the panel rightly concluded in this case. So again, the appellate body saying that the panel, the first instance decision or the first instance finding was correct. Most often there will be other factors to be considered as well. In conducting this inquiry, panels should give full consideration to all the relevant facts and all the relevant circumstances in any given case. So they have and enjoy a significant margin of appreciation. But at the same time, you look at how high is the degree of substitutability. So even although directly competitive or substitutable products are not 100% identical, they are not like, the closer they are to likeness, let's say they are 95% identical, the less degree, the less allowance, the less possibility, the lower the possibility to apply different tax rates. So if they're almost identical, that means there is only a very, very small of tax difference allowed. If, however, the degree of substitutability is much lower, that means that a larger tax difference is allowed. So going back to our previous example, Japan Alcoholic Beverages 2, if, say, you would come to the conclusion that gin and vodka are very similar, then only a very small tax difference is okay. If, however, hypothetically speaking, you compare vodka with beer, both of them are alcoholic beverages, both are consumed, for example, in bars, nightclubs, perhaps restaurants after dinner, but there is a significant difference nevertheless, and that means that you may impose also largely different taxes when it comes to these products. You look at how close are they to being perfectly or 100% identical. And the closer they are, the less tax difference is okay. But at the same time, however, the actual impact of such tax differences on trade is irrelevant. You look at the, again, the competitive relationship, but not at what happens in reality. And this leads us to the other key provision in GATT Article 3, Paragraph 4. Paragraph 2 refers to taxes and internal charges of any kind, whereas Paragraph 4 refers to internal laws and regulations. So these are the three paragraphs you need to remember. The first one about Article 3 laying out, sketching the overall application and the aim of GATT Article 3. Paragraph 2 then dealing with taxes and the fourth one dealing with internal laws and regulations. And it prohibits discrimination of other kind, i.e. measures affecting the internal sale, offering for sale, purchase, transportation, distribution or use of the imported product. And here you have to ask three questions. And if you answer all of these three questions with a yes, then you have a violation of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 4 then you have unlawful discrimination. First, you look once again, are the two products at hand like products? Second, after having asked, answered this question in the affirmative, look at, is the measure that is discriminatory in nature, is it a law, a regulation, or a requirement affecting the internal sale, offering for sale, purchase, transportation, distribution, or use? So here, as you may imagine, a very broad field of application. And Last but not least, if you have answered both of these questions with a yes, you wonder whether the imported products are afforded a less favorable treatment than the like domestic products. Concerning the first question, likeness. As I indicated earlier, once again, this one here is wider than the scope of the first sentence of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 2. Once again, why? Because first sentence, Paragraph 2 of GATT Article 3, includes a very narrow category. Why narrow? Because you have a fallback category of directly competitive or substitutable products in sentence two. But the concept of likeness in paragraph four is not as broad as the one you find in sentence two of paragraph two. So in other words, likeness in the sense of paragraph four does not equate directly competitive or substitutable product. It is somewhat narrow. And again here, however, you wonder 
what is the nature and extent of the competitive relationship between these products. So the basic concept of likeness and also of directly competitive or substitutable remains the same one. The difference is, the, and the devil is as always in the detail, at this point there is no need to further flesh out the precise contours of this rule. All that matters here is that it is not as broad as directly competitive or substitutable products, but also not as narrow as likeness in the sense of sentence one, paragraph two, article three. This is also yet again a distinct category of likeness, the one that we find in get article three, paragraph four. And once again, when determining whether two products are like for the purposes of get article three, paragraph four, all pertinent evidence has to be examined, considered, taken into account. And then the third question, the decisive one is, is there less favorable treatment to imported products and in connection or when contrasted to domestic products? Again, here you look at, does it, the measure at hand, the state measure, the regulation, the law, or any other measure having an impact on imported products in the given, in the given market, whether there is, a, whether they, these measures diminish the effective equality of opportunities for imported products. Because once again, you want an even playing field here. And at the same time, that also means that it is not possible to balance less favorable treatment in one area with more favorable treatment in another area. You look at one measure and not at the overall picture here. And again here, you look at when making this determination, you look at an examination of whether a measure modifies the conditions of competition in the relevant market to the detriment of imported products. This is what you look at and the one specific measure and not the overall picture because otherwise countries could say yeah we know that there might be one law that is only applicable in connection with foreign products but look again there is some privilege being granted to foreign products in another area. You don't want to start such a it's a bargaining or it's not like at a bazaar. No, you literally look at the one measure at hand and say, okay, equal treatment for both parties. And that's the end of the story. And here we have one specific example, and that is from the case India Autos. What happened here? There was a prescription to include a minimum in local content requirements, something you also find in investment law. When countries say, okay, so we want to lure in, we want to attract foreign investors, but at the same time, we want to oblige them to use some local produce, some local products, some local work. However, in this case, there was a regulation that required manufacturers of cars to sign a memorandum of understanding. However, this memorandum of understanding, MOU, imposed an obligation to use a certain proportion of local parts and components when manufacturing cars and vehicles. So that amounted to less favorable treatment. Because once again, here, there is a certain relationship between imports and exports, trade balancing requirements, and this is a condition that requires the balancing of imports with exports, meaning that it is incompatible with GATT Article 3, Paragraph 4. It amounts to less favorable treatment and therefore less uh, to a violation of GATT Article 3, paragraph 4. Other examples include limitation on point of sale for imported alcoholic beverages. So if you can buy a domestic alcoholic beverage in every supermarket, but only in certain markets specifically designated for foreign alcohol, that is obviously a disadvantageous rule. Or a regulation requiring the distribution of all imported newspapers and periodicals through only one particular distribution channel. Also less favorable treatment, therefore unlawful. If you can only sell imported beer at six pack size, whereas domestic beer can also be sold in larger quantities than six pack, let's say a 12 pack, again, less favorable treatment. Or if imported beer and wine can only be sold through in-state wholesalers, once again, less favorable treatment. If foreign cigarette producers are being banned from advertising, whereas domestic ones can advertise all they, all they want, once again here, if you want to protect the public health of a population, that's okay from the perspective of the WTO. If you want to do so by discriminating against foreign producers of cigarettes, 
there is a protectionist element and therefore this is not justified. If the health of your population is of your concern, you have to protect them from all types of cigarettes and not only from foreign ones. If Another example, if additional marking requirements are necessary for foreign products, so for example the name of the producer or the place of origin of a certain product, and at the same time this is not necessary for domestic ones, that may amount to a violation of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 4. And last but not least, from a case involving Brazil, the obligation to dispose of 10 used tires is a prerequisite for the importation of one retreated tire. Once again, this would also amount to a violation of GATT Article 3, Paragraph 4. These are some examples you find, in particular there is a long list of examples in the textbook by Van den Bosche and Bernhard Stutsch on the law and policy of the World Trade Organization. And this concludes our part on national treatment concerning trade in products. However, there is also trade in services where you have an, a similar requirement to abstain from discriminating in, fo in favor of domestic service suppliers. The equivalent to GATT Article 3 is GATT's Article 17. However, once again, the major difference here is that it is not as broad and it's not as strict as the GATT. So here you need a WTO member to make special or certain commitments to open its service markets. So what you can see in the practice of WTO members is that they are much more open to allow foreign products to enter their markets than foreign services and service suppliers. In other words, Material goods are considered as less harmful to the domestic markets than foreign workers or foreign service suppliers or foreign people working in the service sector. What you need here is individually for each WTO member a commitment to open your market for foreign service suppliers. Whereas with products, it is assumed that they have or it is assumed that they grant equal treatment to all foreign products as in connection or as in comparison to domestic products. Here you need a special commitment to say okay we're opening one specific service sector for foreign service suppliers. This is what such a schedule of specific commitments looks like. This is an example and here you have first you identify the sector or the subsector where the services are being rendered. Then you can first also issue limitations on market access. We'll come back to this topic when we speak about market access in general, tariffs and also market access for service suppliers and in addition you may limit national treatment for service suppliers once they have entered your markets. And there are four in general, four different types of service suppliers where you can impose such limitations. These are the four different types of services. First is cross-border supply of services. The second one is the consumption of services that are being rendered in one state in another state. The third one is the actual commercial presence of a foreign service suppliers and the last one, the fourth category, concerns the presence of natural persons so offering services in another country. And with all four of these different types of services or subtypes of services and service supply, you can impose certain limitations. So examples include, and there is a list um, that was also prepared and at the WTO level, for example, you can say, okay, certain nationality or residence requirements have to be met, or a certain amount of assets has to be invested in local currency, or local content requirements, or you have to transfer technology or training to domestic service suppliers. It's also possible to discriminate when it comes to taxation between foreign and domestic service suppliers. If you have said, okay, we're opening our service market, but only under the precondition that we will still grant preferential tax treatment to domestic service suppliers. Then licensing and licensing necess necessities here. Think of skiing instructors or lawyers. If you, as an Austrian skiing instructor, want to start a business in Canada, you need to have the highest license possible that you can acquire in Austria, for example, or lawyers. Think about that. It's even a problem inside of the European Union, whether you can offer your services if you were trained and have your license in one member state, if you can also fully offer it in another EU member state. On an international level, that is obviously even much more complicated because every state has its own laws and regulations. 
there you can also attach restrictions when it comes to purchasing land for foreigners so you would say or foreign foreign companies saying okay you cannot purchase land or only a limited amount then you can also attach um, an equipment the exception that the special subsidies or tax privileges are only granted to domestic suppliers of services and last but not least you can also uh, impose differential capital requirements and special operation limits that are only applicable in connection with foreign service suppliers and not domestic ones what does that mean at the end of the day article 17 paragraph 1 of the gets imposes a four-tier test so four questions have to be answered in affirmative to come to the conclusion that there has been a violation of the gets and the national treatment requirements included in the gets first you ask the question whether and if so to what extent a national treatment commitment was made if there was no national treatment commitment whatsoever that means there is no necessity to include to um, abstain from discriminating between domestic and foreign service suppliers next you look at does the measure affect trade in services cross-border trade in services third question is are the services alike and also are the service suppliers like that's an interesting question we don't have a lot of Jewish um, WTO jurisprudence on that question long story short for the time being what we know is that there seems to be an indication that if the service is similar then the service supply is also similar but that does not necessarily need to be the case so it is highly questionable whether that's indeed what the WTO was aiming for and what the WTO members had in mind when also including the provision that not only the service needs to be identical or like but also the service supplier but we don't really know because there is a lack of jurisprudence when two service suppliers are indeed like service suppliers whether it's also sufficient that they provide the same service and that also means that the service supplier behind it is also like whether we can automatically assume that for the time being there seems to be an indication to that direction but that needs to be questioned or we are not 100% certain in this regard for the lack of jurisprudence on this subject matter or substantive jurisprudence on that subject matter there is only one case where it was found by the WTO that services if they're the same services that the same service suppliers are also like and last but not least the question that needs to be answered here is once you found that services are like service suppliers are like the measure affects trade and services and the national treatment commitment was being made in what I showed to you earlier here in such a specific commitment of a certain country and the last question you have to answer is whether the foreign services and service suppliers are being accorded treatment no less favorable again in other words is there discrimination negative discrimination that sums up or that concludes our session on national treatment both in the get and the gets as you could see this is a very complicated these both of them are very complicated articles the one connection in connection with products get article 3 because it is further subdivided and even the paragraphs themselves are further subdivided into two sentences but at the end of this day in particular the questions you have to ask yourselves whenever making a determination whether there is a violation of national treatment are hopefully at least helpful in this regard having said that i'm happy that you were all listening here we will also keep talking in our next session about market access and we'll continue with this class i hope that it was interesting for you and see you in our next session. Goodbye.